Good afternoon, Bolingbrook Church. I want you guys to hold me accountable. All right, is that all right? I'm going to ask you guys for something. Here at this church, if we speak any other name than the name of Jesus Christ, hold us accountable. If we lift up any other name other than the name of Jesus Christ, hold us accountable. Because it is only through Jesus, it is only through the name of Jesus Christ that we are set free. Amen. Let's give a round of applause for Jesus, for Jesus Christ, who has no rival, who has no equal, whose kingdom is now and forever. Let me pray with you guys. Lord Jesus, be with us today. Empty me off this stage. Take me off. Fill me with you and you alone, Lord. Let the words that I speak not be mine, but Jesus. Let the thoughts that I think not be mine, but Jesus. Let my feelings in my heart not be mine, but Jesus, Lord, so that everyone can see what a beautiful name Jesus has. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're taking a look at... This idea, our sermon title for today, is called Living Freedom. Living Freedom. And the, the title might be confusing at first, but I'm sure that I, I, I pray that after this sermon that you'll be able to understand why it's called Living Freedom. And I also want to do, I might do another prayer uh, later on for those who um, uh, broke the Sabbath and watched the, the finals game yesterday. I want to hold a special prayer moment for you after because sometimes we're just not free from the things that we have, right? And maybe the reason why the Cavs won yesterday is because we all watched it. I'm, not, I'm just saying, from my perspective, I waited till the sun was right at the edge. And I was like, man, Curry, just pull it off. It's only almost the first quarter, but you got to do it. But I'm, I'm so glad you guys are here today. God has given us an amazing message I, I made it, when I first got into ministry not too long ago, it's been a year, I, I'm, I'm fresh, I'm green as they get, but I made a, a commitment to God, I made a pact, I made an oath with God, and I said my motto from here on out, from, from the moment I started ministry to whenever God decides that I'm done, is that I will preach the gospel, die, and not be remembered, because it is only the gospel, it is only the gospel, the good news of Jesus that really sets someone free, and that's it. I was wondering today, what, what should I preach? I, when, when Jose asked me to preach for today, I said, okay, I got to figure out something cool that the, that the audience can be like, wow, that's amazing. Or what doctrine can I open up so people can see that, wow, Adventism is really amazing, or this and that. And then I'm reminded that the gospel has so much power. The name of Jesus has so much power. And today we're talking about how this name Jesus frees us. So right now we're taking a look at where it all began. I love going back to the beginning of things. I, I've been kind of a Genesis buff my first year of ministry. Go figure. Kind of, kind of a joke there that I'm beginning my ministry. And the first book that I'm kind of infatuated with has been the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, I love going back to that because in order for us to know where we are going, we have to know where we came from. Say it with me. In order to know where we are going, we have to know where we came from. So we're looking at where we came from, where our grassroots as human beings are, what God has made us, has formed us, has transformed us. In his head, when he first thought, I'm going to make mankind in my image, what was that image like? And so we're in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 goes into a very particular day of creation. It goes into the day that humans were made. So we're picking up, and I want you guys to understand this, that when God was making human beings, because of who he is, because he is an all-powerful God, because he has all, the, whatever that looks like, we, we attach the word omnipotence to it, but reality, we, we have no idea what that means, right? He must be really, really strong. But still, we have no idea. So God, in his omnipotence, had options when he was creating people, right? 
But mind you, I want you to understand that, that when God was, had people in mind, he had a very particular thing in mind. What was that thing? To make sure that he accomplished. Do you guys know? It was to make people in his what? In his image. That's, that's his motive. He, whatever he's going to make, it's going to look like him in both capacities and in relationship. So he had a couple, he had a few options. He had three options specifically that, that I could logically think of. The first option is that if he was supposed to make people in his image and his image is love, his first option was either he could make robots, right? He could make robots where he would program into human beings, um, love me, and then he would flip us on, and what would we have to do? We would love him, right? So that, that was an option God had. But the only problem with that is, is that we would be acting out in love. That's my robot dance. How is it? Is it good? He, we would be acting out love, but we would never be in love. Do you, guys get, can, do you guys catch that? We would act out. Have you guys ever had a relationship where you acted out like you love them, but you weren't actually in love with them? Don't look at your, at your spouse right now or your girlfriend or boyfriend. Look at, look at me. But the fact that if we were to make robots, these autonomous kind of beings that were automatically predispositioned to love God and programmed to love God, we would act out love but never be in love. His second option. His second option was he could have made slaves. And with a slave, he would say, love me. And if we said no, he would take out his proverbial his gun or whip or whatever you think he has. And he would point it to our heads and he would say, no, seriously, you have to love me. It's kind of like, I mean, imagine if you started a relationship like that with a, a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Or you asked someone to marry you and you said, will you marry me? And the person says no. And you said, well, I mean, I have this gun. And so do you, would you reconsider? <laughs> what, what are you forced to do? Either what? You die or you say, I love you, but even also in that, you are what? Acting out love, but never in love. But see, the thing is with God, the person who he is, because God is love and love is freely given. It's not love until someone loves you. You give them the freedom to love you back. Am I right? It's not love until you can say that I run the risk of you saying no to me. Now, when I was growing up, I learned about dating girls through my cousin Mark. My cousin Mark was this tall, he's, he's full Filipino, mind you that. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly short for an individual, right? Um, tall for a Filipino, but short in the world standards. And so my cousin, being Filipino, is 6'4", full Filipino, by the way. 6'4", and his brother is 6'6". Six, six right? Everyone in the Philippines thinks they're basketball players, <laughs> like they're on the professional team. And so when my cousin Mark would start dating, and he would bring me along on these dates, because like little did I know that he would use his little cousin as like a, like, like, like a trick, right? Like, oh, this is my little cousin. I, I love him so much. <laughs> He's great. And the girls would be like, oh, you brought your little cousin on the date. And I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm here. And so he would bring me on this date, and I learned dating from him, so I always saw, oh, Mark, Mark has a bunch of girlfriends. Mark had all these girlfriends. I hope Mark's not listening. I love you, Mark. <laughs> Mark had all these girlfriends, so I'm like, yo, I can, I can do that. So I got to sixth grade, and I was like, um, man, I need to do what Mark can do, and I need to have a girlfriend. And when I, I started asking girls, her first name was Kayla. I'm not going to share her last name because she still lives in the area. So... <laughs> Um, her name was Kayla, and I went up to Kayla, and I said, Kayla, would you be my, what do you think I said, girlfriend? And she said, yes, and we lived happily ever. She said, no. She goes, this is the first time I heard this, and I carried this throughout my whole life. She says, David, you're just a really good, oh. <laughs> David, you're like a, <laughs> Dude, but I can't, you're, you're too much of a good friend. I, I would hate to ruin this relationship with something like dating. And so I learned quick. 
I said, all right, forget you. And I go to the next girl. <laughs> hey, Emmy. I won't say her last name because she also lives in the area. Emmy, would you be my, and she goes, no, Dave. And then I had this reputation amongst my peers because I had this idea of what love looks like. And I thought, if I can just, if I just ask them out, they'll say yes, right? That's how it works. Until over and over again, I've heard brother probably like 50 or 60 times during that time. And friend, and I don't want to ruin this relationship. But it was never, I had a very skewed imagination of what a relationship looks like. Because a real relationship is when you are saying, I give you the option to love me or love me not. He loves me, he loves me not. We have that option. God was like, in order for me to give them my image, they have to look like love. And love requires freedom. But love also requires risk. Parents run this risk all the time. I remember when I was growing up, uh, when I got my license, I, you know, my cousin Mark, I got, man, I have stories with Mark. You guys are going to hear it all year long. Mark was uh, a, a racer, right? He was, he had all these different cars and he got me into driving cars and taught me how to drive stick and he taught me how to put this part on your engine and make your car look like this and he started drifting, right? Drifting is when you're going around a corner and you don't take it correctly. You actually go sideways around a corner, very dangerous. And I remember asking my mom, hey, mom, uh, Mark, my, my cousin Mark, I call him Kuya. I'll introduce you guys to the word named Kuya. Kuya means older brother in Philippine. Can you guys say Kuya? Yeah. Kuya. Yeah, we all know it. Now we have context. So I'm like, mom, Kuya, Mark, and I, we're going out drifting. Can I go with him? And I, she didn't hear me. I, I don't think she heard me when I said it. I said, Mom, it's going to be on a track. It's going to be on, it's like, it's like an official racetrack. We're going to be drifting. And you know your mom says no to you when she doesn't have to say no, but she doesn't stop what she's doing, right? So my mom was cooking, and I'm like, hey, Mom, can I go drifting with Mark? Mom, it's going to be on a track. It's going to be fun. Mm. Interesting. And I, I, I begged and I pleaded with her, Mom, please let me go, please let me go. And she came to the realization, I was bringing my friend Brian. My friend Brian, we, we, us two were both into cars really, really aggressively. And Brian and I were like, oh, can, can we both go? And she, she looked at me and she goes, okay, I trust you. I'm putting my trust in you. And she let me go. And later that day, Brian's mom called my mom, and she's like, do you know what they're doing? Do you know what they're doing? They're going out to a racetrack. They're going to go drifting. Do they have helmets? And my mom looks at her, and she goes, Cindy, we love our boys. And in order for them to be free, if we really love them, it's going to be risky. But we can't keep them in for the rest of their lives. And so God, the same way, looks at Adam and Eve, and he says, you have to be free. We'll take a look at verse, chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took man, and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And this is what he made us for from the beginning. And the Lord God commanded the man, command, you are free to eat. God didn't go to Adam and he say, oh, um, Adam, uh, you can do this, you can do that. Um, oh, Adam, uh, make sure, make sure you, you, you put the, uh, the junipers in this section and the, uh, the lilacs in this section. Oh, uh, Adam, uh, don't touch the tree over there. Oh, Adam, make sure that the water's flowing this way. Not. He didn't do that. What he did was he approached freedom from the positive. And he says, you can do this. But here, we see a system in our world where we turn religion into a time of don'ts. Oh, you, 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 you can't do that. Oh, you're a pastor. You have to wear a suit when you're on stage. I've gotten flack for the short sleeves before. <laughs> you have to do this. But God says, he looks at Adam, and he says, you are free to eat. Let's, let's take a guess how many trees were in the garden. A million, Right? So there was a million minus one trees that he could freely eat and one that he couldn't. 
So whatever Adam did, can I do this? Yes. Can I do that? Yes. And this and this and this and this and yes and yes and yes and yes and yes and yes and yes. Why? Because Adam was living in the confines of God's relationship. He was living in, in the borders of God. The moment that he decided to step out of it, that's when things get wrong. We go on, we're going to skip through it. We end up in verse 3. Now, it's kind of cool. The, the entire story of the Bible, can, I feel like, can be summarized in the first three chapters. If you want to know what the, the rest of the story of the Bible is like, take a look at these three chapters, 1, 2, and 3. Here, in chapter 3, we're introduced to this adversary. The word Satan in um, Hebrew, Satan, literally means the adversary, the one against and here he's looked at as the serpent. And I want you guys to pay attention in chapter 3 about the way they describe Satan. Now the serpent was more what? Crafty. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. What doesn't it say about the serpent? It doesn't say that he's strong. It doesn't say that he has might. It doesn't say that he's a worthy opponent. It says that he's what? Crafty. In other, in other words, it says he's subtle. Others, it says that, which basically gives this idea that Satan knows how to use his words really, really well. And so he looks at Eve, and this is what he does to her. The woman's, oh, sorry, uh, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Did God really say that you must not eat? Now, what's the difference between what God actually said and what Satan is saying? Satan is approaching it from the negative. He's saying, did God really say that you can't? Did God say that? What he's doing is he's taking God's word and he's manipulating in such a way that he's making Eve believe something that she already has is something that she's actually lacking. I'll put it another way. As he says the, to, the, to, the, to the woman, did he say that you must not eat from any tree? And, and Eve, instead of um, calling God an almighty being to talk to the serpent, she decides to dialogue herself. And she goes, oh, well, uh, God said, yeah, well, he did say that we may, we may eat from the tree, from the garden. Notice what word she's missing there. The word free. She's missing the word freedom in her mind now. Because the moment that she dialogues with Satan, this teaches us a very valuable lesson, that when Satan comes talking to you, you don't talk back, you call on Jesus. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that Satan is a worthy opponent for God. And because he couldn't physically dethrone God, he's trying to bring his image down. And that's why he's attacking God's image. Take a look at this. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but he did say you must not eat from the tree of the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or, touch it or you will die. And Satan says, you, you won't die. For God knows when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you see what Satan's doing? He's trying to pitch freedom to free people. He's trying to give the gift that was already theirs. He wanted to take it and repackage it and sell it as something else. Hey, it's like saying to someone that's not in prison, hey, um, I can get you out of prison. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in prison. No, but seriously, I have this freedom that you could have. And that's what he did with Adam and Eve. He made them believe this insane lie that they weren't free and what satan did was he introduced this system into humanity the system that says that you're not free that you are slaves to sin and i want to find ourselves to where jesus has to say about this jesus says that i'm not here to abolish what was said what was the law before but i'm here to fulfill them 
Jesus is the fulfillment of what God had planned for humanity. And right now, I want us to open up to John chapter 8. We're fast forwarding, and I want to let you guys know that the Old Testament is all talking about who Jesus is. Every single prophet, every single king, every single judge was all talking about Jesus. And now we're at the moment where Jesus is walking among the earth, and he's doing what he's What Jesus was doing was he's trying to reinstate what was destroyed in the beginning. So whatever things were destroyed in the beginning, he wants to bring back to life. And so we have the story in John 8 where Jesus is talking to this woman that's caught in adultery. She's breaking the law back in that day. Verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, right? Because Jesus, you approve the law, right? Jesus, you're the one who's supposed to uphold the law, right? Am Am I right, Jesus? Moses' law commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap. They were doing the same exact thing that Satan was doing in the beginning to twist words, words that were used to free people and try to change them into words that confined people. He says, woman, now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to give a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down. Notice what Jesus didn't do. What he didn't do? He didn't start dialoguing the way Eve did. He didn't start trying to defend the law. What he did was he started, he just bent down, and it says he wrote in the ground. He wrote in the ground. He started drawing with his finger, and he wrote in the ground, and he did this. When they kept on questioning, he straightened up to them, and he said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her, And again, he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. So this is what happened. I want you guys to have a visual about what happened. So they're questioning Jesus, do you uphold the law or not? And he stooped down and looked at him and he he started drawing. Now a lot of commentaries say, uh, another writer in the Adventist Church, Ellen White, she said that what Jesus was writing in the ground was the sins of everyone that was present in that area. And then when they asked him again, what did he do? He, it said he straightened up to them. Have you ever, have you ever seen, I, I know, I, I've seen my mom do this to people that have hurt me. I come home and, mommy, she, she, she hit me. This girl hit me in the face at the playground. And I said, mommy, and her mom said, good, good job. She didn't care that I was hit. And this little girl hit me. And my mom's like, well, one, why are you being hit by little girls? What's wrong with you? And then when she found out that their parents actually encouraged it, um, my mother, I, I, can, I can imagine her now, which, and my mom's a very small Asian lady, right? And when she would, to anyone, posture up to anyone, when she would show her the authority that she had, she would posture up, and she looked like 10 feet tall. Because Jesus treats sin consistently throughout the Bible every single way. He's not light with it. Whenever he encounters sin, he postures up to it. He straightens up. And he says, no, no, no. Sin doesn't go farther than me. It doesn't get past me. And so he rolled on the ground and take a look at the way he frees this woman. At this, verse 9, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? The neither I, she says, no, no, sir, there, there's, there's no one here. He looks up and he says, woman, who's, who's here giving your sin to the world? Who, who's, who's here displaying your sin? Is, is anyone doing it? And she says, no, sir. There's no one here. He goes, I, I know I don't. Because Jesus said, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to set free. The problem with sin is that we get so comfortable in it, and we learn to live in the system. 
And that's where broken relationships happen. That's where addictions happen. We tend to say, even though we're in prison, we can still be free. We, if, if we, we just have these rules that we, that we come up with and saying, um, uh, I, I, I can quit whenever I want. Oh, don't, don't worry, I, I'm, not, I'm not a slave to my addiction. I can, I, whenever I want to quit, I can quit. I just, I just choose not to. But Jesus says, no, you are free and I can, you are, you, you are not free and I can set you free. So he looks at the woman and he says, neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. And this is a really important part that I think is amazing. God didn't, Jesus didn't come down to save us just to get us out of hell. He came down to save us. He came down and died for us so he can get the hell out of us. Take a look at this. When Jesus, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Who, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness again, but I will have the light of life. Jumping down to verse 14, Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid for I know where I, what, came from and I know where I'm going because free people have a testimony. And a testimony is simple. I know where God found me and I know where he's taking me. Because Jesus didn't come here and die for us and resurrect for us just to get us to heaven. We, we get so caught up in, oh, one day he's going to take us to heaven and everything will be all right. Jesus didn't come down here just to take us to heaven one day. He came down here and died for us so he can bring heaven into us right now. He's, he's looking for something bigger for us. He's looking for something grander for us. He's saying you can be free at the moment. The reality that Jesus has is this, and I'm not done with the, with the Genesis story. Jump back to Genesis chapter 3 because the story with Adam and Eve isn't over. And like I said, it kind of just perpetuates and Jesus kind of just finalizes it. But after Satan introduces this system of sin into humanity that we get so comfortable in, that we learn to live in, Jesus, take a look at this. Take a look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, I imagine him posturing up the same way he straightened up when the Pharisees were accusing the woman. And he postured up to Satan. Kind of like when my mom finds out that someone hurt me. A mother postures up. A father postures up. And, say, and, and God looks at Satan and says, you're done. From this day forward, you have no real power. You have an illusion of power, but you don't have real power. Look, look to what he says. Curse you above all livestock, all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust for the rest of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between you and her offspring and hers, one of her offspring, someone born of a woman, is going to crush your head. But you're going to strike his heel. He might be wounded, but your time is over. We need to stop fighting our battles. We need to stop thinking that it's up to us to be morally pure. We have to stop thinking that Jesus has no power in our lives to make us who we are meant to be. The gospel is simple. That we don't have to do anything for us to be free. There's nothing that I can do to make me less free. There's nothing I can do to make me more free. There's a story in, the, in, 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 uh, in World War II about this, this, this guy. His name is Hiro Onoda. And he's a Japanese soldier in the Philippines. And he fought World War II for 29 years after the war was over. The war ended in 1945. He kept fighting even though there was a truce. And they sent, uh, they sent a plane with, with pamphlets. And they dropped letters from his, from his mother. And... Uh, uh, different orders from different places. And he's, he looked at them and said, oh, this isn't real. I'm still fighting. And so he fought for 29 years until someone came along and said, you know the war is over, right? Don't you, don't you know that there was a, a big bomb? There's two big bombs. That, you don't know that? And he goes, I won't know I'm free until I hear from my superior. Give me a letter from my superior and I'll believe that I'm free. 
So he went, his, the, the guy went back to Japan, came back with orders from his commander, and his commander saying, Hiro, stop fighting. The war is over. And we're asking Jesus for the same proof. Thomas asked Jesus, he says, I won't believe Jesus has resurrected until I see the holes in his hand and on his side and on his feet. And Jesus walked up to Thomas and he says, Thomas, put your fingers inside. The war is over. Put, see this wound on my side here. The war is over. The devil is done. The grave couldn't keep Jesus. Satan could, with what, the way Jesus won the war was he did this. He took on sin. The very thing that God cannot accept, but he was the person that God had to accept. And then Jesus says in, in Mark, he says, if uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand, if Satan opposes himself, he will end. And so Jesus took the penalties of death, took the penalty of sin, died on the cross, walked into the grave, and said, I told you. I told you this day would come. And Satan looked at him and he says, but you've died, but I can't keep you here. And I have to let a human being out of the grave. And Jesus is extending this freedom to us. Paul says this. I'll end with this. It's so powerful. Galatians chapter 2, verse 17. I'll end with this, I promise. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners. He jumps down to verse 20. I have been crucified in Christ, and I no longer live, but the Christ who lives in me. Look to your neighbor and say, Christ lives in me. Look to someone in front of you. Touch someone in front of you and say, Christ lives in me. Repeat after me, Christ lives in me. Let's say it again. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. He goes on, the life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ will set us free if only he gets to live in us. Christ is, Jesus is our living freedom because Jesus is alive. He's roaring like a lion. He's fighting our battles. He's saying to Satan, your time is over. These people here are free. Everyone in this congregation right now, he saw this from the, the moment time began, that everyone would be in here being set free today. That is the gospel that I preach. That is the gospel that is changing us. That is the gospel that sets people free. Jesus is our living freedom if only we let him live in us.